Stanley presents, oh, hey, that's me, The Further Adventures of Indiana Jones, Excelsior. Welcome. It's time for The Further Adventures of Indiana Jones. The ultimate hero in the ultimate adventures. I don't know, I'm making this up as I go. Pack your bag, grab your passport, and prepare to go globetrotting with classic four-color adventures of Indiana Jones. Jones? Jones! Mr. Jones, I've heard a lot about you, sir. Your appearance is exactly the way I imagined. (laughs) (laughs) I'm here now. What do you want to talk about? Welcome, IndieCast listeners and further fans to the Further Adventures of Indiana Jones. I'm Joe Stuber. And I'm Keith Voss. Joe, we have some Indiana Jones news. Woohoo! Yes, we do. Yes, we do. <laughs> Finally. we've uh, How long? How many episodes of the IndieCast and Further Adventures have we gone and we're like, no news. Oh, delayed. Oh, t- hey, there's actually something happening. So we talked, uh, Laird and Ron and I talked a little bit about this on last week's John Williams special, but I haven't had a chance to kind of go over this with you yet. I'll ask you what I asked them. Are you, is it because it's Indiana Jones? It's like, take my money and, no, or, no, okay. No, 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 no. no <laughs> I just no, wanted to no, be no. sure. Because no. we have the Blu-rays. Um, you have the Blu-rays, right? <sighs> Yeah, I, I have the Blu-rays, but you know what? I, I don't need the 4K releases. I know that there's going to be some new uh, some new artwork uh, and you know steel cases, yeah, steel books, steel books, right? Yeah, right. But honestly, you know what? Give me the deleted scenes, Lucas. You're not going to get them. You're don't, not going to get them. <laughs> don't keep putting the same old stuff on these discs. <laughs> if you expect us to 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 rebuy these things, to double dip, to triple dip, to quadruple yeah. dip, give us something new. Uh, you know, it's so no. There, th- this All time right. I gotta I gotta. I got to say no. But I think that's more of a George Lucas thing. Like George Lucas is going to release like 8,000 versions of something, but he's always going to tweak and it's always going to be different. And there's always going to be stuff that we haven't had before. I think, and I I don't know this for a fact, but I think you and I and every IndieCast listener and Indiana Jones fan out there knows that Spielberg's movies and, and Spielberg has control. I mean, the director has control in these situations. Spielberg's movies, generally what you what you see is what you get. What you see in the theater is what you get. I'm actually shocked on some of those uh, other releases that we even have those hints of the deleted scenes because you never see that. He never releases a commentary. We don't get like a lot of deleted scenes. I mean, maybe there's a couple here and there that somebody could prove wrong. But for the most part, we don't really get those. The movie he has is the movie we see. So... I'd be really surprised if we ever see those deleted scenes or like a director's cut or. But then why you know, even tease it <laughs> hashtag at all? Release this Spielberg cut. We got yeah, the Spielberg yeah, we get, cut. We get the Snyder <laughs> cut, but we don't get the Indiana Jones. Uh, you know, we don't get the Indiana Jones deleted scenes. We, uh, but we do get we get clips of them, snippets right. of them. Yeah. Why even do that? I mean, it, it's just the ultimate for me. It's very much yeah. a almost a slap. It's a tease. Uh, well, it's a tease. It, you we know, need to know that stuff's out there. I know. It's. I look. Here's the thing. I'm. I'm. Pro- I'm weighing it too because it. It is basically the same version as the Blu-rays from what I can see. But you get a little different artwork, and as Laird mentioned, you know, different audio mix and things like that. So if you, you know, if you're tricked out and you're like this big audio file, and then that's all, fine. I get maybe that. Maybe that's fine. Yeah. Or if you don't have the Blu-rays, then obviously this is the set uh, to go get. I'm just. I love the fact that there is a new Indiana Jones release, which tells me that they're gonna. That they're you know obviously with the 40th anniversary. So that's in Disney's brain. And, and they're gearing up. They're gearing up for more uh, uh, Indiana Jones news and releases heading up to Indy 5, you know? Yeah. So. I, I mean, that's what I'm hoping for. I'm hoping, you know, and look, here's the thing. As we get closer and closer, so hopefully we're going to see some production on Indy 5, all these different things. Hopefully a new Indiana Jones comic book from Marvel. I mean, we, you and I have talked about that. But always on further adventures, we're always going to be taking a look back at Indy's previous four-color adventures. We've talked about the Marvel years. We've talked about the Dark Horse years. Big guest on the show today. And to be honest, Keith, I don't know why we haven't done this earlier. <laughs> yeah, me neither. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, you always seem to be uh, more or less number one on our list, right? Yeah, and we yeah. finally were able to 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 get him to to, yep. to nail down some time with him. Uh, definitely one of my favorite artists. Um, uh, you know, just uh, like I said, I'll never forget. Uh, you know, 14 years old, walking into uh, my local comic shop and seeing that 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 cover 
for uh, that first cover for Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis number one. You know, we we, we got Dave Dorman joining us today, guys. Oh, this is going to be a long time coming on this one, too. And so. a big shout out to the folks at the Indie Magazine. They did a really nice profile on on, on Dave uh, yeah. and an interview with him in the, in the February 2017 issue, even an artist commentary on his cover for issue number two of Iron Phoenix. But, I mean, he's joining us today yeah. on the IndieCast. Yeah, he's doing a lot of stuff. Facebook Lives, we're going to be talking about that. Yeah, that was a pretty cool article. Uh, February 2017, again, for the indie mag and it, it really kind of gives that um that artist commentary of yeah just like you see his drum we'll talk about this but you see some of his reference points in there a lot of original art that artwork that he submitted to um uh, junior jones and and everybody over at the over at the indie mag too so um d- you know after today go back and check it or you know click it up right now and we'll follow along with us because we're gonna be talking about some of those things uh those pieces of artwork in there again long time coming for this chat let's not waste another moment of time time to head into the raven's nest to chat with indiana jones and star wars artist extraordinary Dave Dorman. Uh, joining us now in the Raven's Nest is an Eisner Award winning artist famous for his work in comics, novels, games, and way beyond that. He has illustrated iconic comic book characters like Superman and Batman, and his photorealistic work has set him apart as a true visionary in the worlds of Star Wars, Alien, Predator, and of course, our favorite archaeologist, Indiana Jones. A big welcome to Dave Dorman. Dave, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, I don't know what to say after that. I'm I'm sort of speechless. <laughs> you can't be speechless. It's an interview. Yeah. It's going to be the shortest episode yeah. ever. No, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Always, happy, uh, happy to have pleasure you. Pleasure to share what I do. Happy Thanks to have so much you here. For joining us. Virtual yeah. hangout today. No need to social distance here in the Raven's Nest. Uh, we don't have masks here. Of course, the masks in the rural world, but here you can order all the virtual drinks you want. VIP right. table, they're all in the house, so we thank you for joining us here. Let's look at the real world, though. How have things been for you in the real world this past year? A little crazy, but uh, you're still you're still crushing. You're still getting work done, though, right? Yeah. Um, for me, you know, it hasn't changed because I work out of the house. So, you know, um, I didn't have to move. You know, my wife, uh, her office closed. So uh, she's been working here out of the house for a year. What's and that been son, like to have you guys both working together? Is that unusual for the artist? Um, uh, it, you know, it, <laughs> no. Okay, um, good. <laughs> yeah, I, I was married before, and um, um, my wife was a freelance artist as well. So okay. we shared studio space, and and uh, uh, Denise uh, here, uh, she's been working off and on freelance. She's she had. Um, had an office job for the past two years, so I got used to, you know, being in the house alone, uh, and you know, just doing my thing. And uh, uh, you know, last year that all changed. And then, uh, of course, my son uh, wasn't able to attend school anymore, so you know, all three of us were were just in the house all the time, okay. and that was a big change. I mean, for me, uh, you know, I like uh, uh, the solitude when I work. Uh, but my office is sort of off to the side of the house, so that's not a big deal. But, you know, it's um, uh, having to, you know, be quiet when I'm walking around downstairs because my wife's on the kitchen table, you know, set up with her uh, her office thing. So, you know, I can't clang dishes or, you know, open the refrigerator for a snack. And, it's yeah. so like, and, honey, uh, what do you want? A sandwich? Yeah. <laughs> like, I want silence. <laughs> it seems you know? it's definitely something that most of us are uh, are experiencing at the moment, for sure. Um, yeah. yeah, the so, world has changed that way. Yeah, so for me, you know, um, uh, that was really the, the big change okay. as far as, as lifestyle goes. But like I say, I'm, I'm here working every day, so it really didn't change. Uh, yeah, for sure. For you're, me, you're, you're keeping us... You're definitely keeping us entertained in quarantine. That's for sure. I mean, you, Dave's dugout, right? Um, yep. Uh, yep. All your Facebook Live art demos that you do. Uh, when and how did these start? Well, you know, about two years ago, maybe um, a year and three quarters. I can't remember exactly when. Uh, I decided to, you know, just throw the camera on on occasion uh, when I was in the studio working, and um, you know, just to sort of share what was going on. And then as, as uh, uh, the quarantine started, uh, I thought, 
you know, it might be good to, you know, bump that up to, you know, instead of like once a week or, you know, every couple of weeks, you know, to bump it up to, you know, twice a week maybe. And, and, uh, I got a lot of good response and, and people were, were happy to just have something to do, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like a masterclass what, too, because we get to, you know, we see your paintings and things, we see your artwork, but then to see it, the origins of it. Uh, and you're talking, yeah. you're talking about things. So that's pretty cool. When is Indiana Jones going to make his way into the dugout? Uh, at some point, uh, okay. <laughs> uh, I did, I did an indie, uh, uh, piece for, um, um, cool waters for, for their autograph, um, yeah, you did. opportunity. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so, you did. so that was, that was only a couple of months back. Okay. Uh, there's, uh, there'll be, there'll be more Indiana Jones coming up. It's well, not a character that I'm going to abandon. Uh, oh, that's good to hear. <laughs> that's really good to hear. I mean, maybe yeah. this interview, uh, maybe, maybe you being on the indie cast will inspire you to, uh, to, 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 to get some more indie back in Dave's dugout. Or but, the 40th you know, last... anniversary, well, with the 40th anniversary, Keith, I mean, that'd be oh, a perfect yeah, day. We got the 40th yes. anniversary of Raiders perfect coming timing. up. So that'd be a perfect day for you to do like another race. You mentioned that cool waters one. We want to tell people it's out there. What there's, I think there's 25 of those, correct? There's only 25 Correct. and they're autographed by both you and oh somebody else who uh, i'm trying to remember who else autographed that guy it. that guy yeah. that guy with the, the hat, with that, the hat. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little pricey we're gonna yeah. i gotta tell you that it's a little pricey but it, you do get dave is. dorman's signature you get harrison ford's signature, so that's out there so we wanted to we wanted to throw and, and it's limited it's never going to be reprinted so no, i mean it is a, a of them. uh you know a heavy a heavy duty collectible it's not like Keith, you're gonna get me one right um, <laughs> I thought I thought you were gonna get me one. Oh <laughs> man! <laughs> so, wait, wait a minute. Yeah, bro, bro. you know, to be, to be honest, I don't really follow the autograph market, so okay. um, yeah, we don't. You know, I, it, the the ones that I know of are usually the celebrities that go to conventions that I'm at, so I can sort of gauge what uh, you know what the prices are for a lot of those guys. But uh, um, you know, over the past couple of years, these. These uh, autograph uh, opportunities and, and things that come up have uh, really raised the prices quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And yeah. last um, uh, Star Wars celebration I was at, and uh, you know, I was listening to people talk about, you know, people like Mark Hamill and and uh, Daisy Ridley, and and uh, you know, the prices that are going for their signatures, and you know, so I I wasn't sure what Harrison Ford's signature <laughs> would go for, and then. Uh, uh, I found out, and I was just wow. Okay. That you found out real quick. <laughs> that you found out real quick. Yeah, take take a take a second mortgage so out that, in the house. <laughs> that was that was quite the surprise, but I uh, can you know, imagine. You know, fortunately, yeah, fortunately, uh, um, you know, they they gave me one uh, as a thank you. Oh, uh, nice from from Cool Water. So, all right, um, nice. he's he's the only one that I don't have uh, from uh, uh, the Star Wars, uh, right. obviously, and I have. Um, uh, Marion's uh, signature. Um, oh, Karen Allen. Yeah, yeah, Karen awesome. Allen. I, I met her at a, at a show a few years back. She was uh, wonderful. She she hadn't changed a bit. She was just you know cute Thanks as ever her. and yeah. and had that smile and and uh, yeah, yeah it's it, twinkle in her eye too. You the, know, yeah, it just never yeah. goes away. Those it's freckles and, and hopefully you'll just, get to paint her again. Hopefully you get to paint her again yeah. as we as we come 40th up. Fortieth anniversary of readers. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think uh, maybe maybe I'll uh, I'll get something going with that. <laughs> uh, that'd be fantastic. You yeah. know, um, let's 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 turn the clock back uh, a year. So last year you went back to one of your early inspirations. Um, of course, the great fantasy illustrator Frank Frazetta, uh, to recreate some of his iconic work, and, and we just wanted to know how did that idea sort of come about? What 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 made you want to go back and 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 do that? Um, it's sort of sort of a roundabout thing. Um, uh, yeah, uh, Frazetta was one of my major influences when I was very young, and uh, uh, you know, studying you know, comic book art and I was a, a fantasy, uh, fan. So I read a lot of, a lot of, um, uh, books, uh, and Conan was one of those. And really the artwork on the covers were, were something that really drew me to, uh, n no pun intended, drew me to the, uh, uh, you know, the books. And, and, uh, uh, so I really, you know, started copying his work to learn how to paint. Uh, just looking at those paperback covers and and uh, you know 
drawing them and the painting and figuring out how they work. And so, you know, that was, he's been in, in my life, you know, all of my artistic career. Um, and then about uh, four years ago, maybe, uh, a friend of mine asked me if I could uh, do a recreation of this uh, 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 piece of art called Luana that Frazetta did. It was a, sort of a jungle girl with some animals, you know, coming at you. Um, and uh, uh, the original disappeared somewhere along the line in the history of Frazetta art. Um, and uh, there were n not very many good reproductions of it because the art had disappeared. So, you know, I did my research and, and tried to come up with a, a reasonable facsimile of the image uh, so that I could re do the recreation of the painting. And while I was doing it, I, I really, you know, sort of mentally fell back into, you know, being 14 and 15 years old and looking at, at that Frazetta art and trying to figure out how he did it. Now, you know, I'm 40 years into, uh, into my art career and I'm doing basically the same thing I did back when I was 14 and 15. But with uh, an art education mind behind it, and it was really interesting to see what he was doing that I couldn't grasp way back then, but I can grasp now. And it was really a, a secondary education uh, on how he painted to be able to do that reproduction. And um, uh, I really enjoyed it quite a bit. I didn't think that I would enjoy doing you know, a, a, a copy at this point in my career. What was the hook? What was the missing component that you were, that, that maybe you saw now that you didn't back in the day? Uh, it was, it was just understanding how he laid down the paint, mm. uh, being able to look at it now, as opposed to then, um, I, I you know, gradually built his, um, his style into my style. Um, and now being able to look at it with a, a much more trained eye, I could see well it's down paint mm. on on this certain area. He was actually thinning it out with turpentine mm. and making it a wash. And and in, in looking at the, the paintings real close, he really drew a lot of the paintings in, in sepia and browns first and then painted over it. So if you look close enough, you can see these lines that that are familiar if you're familiar with his black and white ink work. Oh yes. And so and so you know he wasn't painting in in the painterly tradition. And so you know those are things I learned over the years. And and in looking at it now and looking at his 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 uh, you know career painting uh, and being able to interpret it uh, with my uh, I now I could see exactly what he was doing. And for me, it's like a whole new world uh, <laughs> because I, mm. because I didn't know what I was doing when I was 14 years old. I was just throwing, throwing paint on and trying to, you know, trying to paint like him, but not knowing how the paint worked. Now you can, yeah, there always seems right. And there always seems to be that like Fritzetta, like vibe. That's, that's like kind of always within your artwork, always within, uh, let's say your artistic head. Yeah, you know it hasn't left, and certainly a, a lot of the influences that I've had over the years are in there. If you can, you know, look close enough to Drew Struzan and and uh, Michael Whalen, and you know, even going back to uh, N.C. Wyeth and Dean Cornwell, and and uh, uh, you know, uh, Mead Schaefer, and and. You know, these guys have just influenced the way that I paint. You well, know, let's go Jeff back to Jones. some of those influences. I want to talk a little bit yeah. about that. You mentioned uh, in in your book, you mentioned that comic books, when you were growing up, comic books represented stability in your life. Can you elaborate on that? How, how did that happen? And then what were yeah, some of the well, influences you saw there in that world? Well, the stability was, was um, uh, that, you know, my dad was military, so we moved around a lot. And we couldn't take a lot of stuff with us when we moved. It was like every two or three years we were moving. So the personal things that, that um, we were able to take weren't many. 
However, I was able to, you know, hold on to, you know, a good number of comic books that I was reading at the time. And this would have been the, the late sixties and, and early seventies. So there would have been, you know, the heyday of fantastic four and Avengers and, and, uh, Thor and Spider-Man and Captain America. And so these were the, the comics that, that I read. And as it turned out, I wasn't unusual in, in you know, being, uh, you know, a little kid at that time, you know, in a military family, a lot of kids my age had comics. <laughs> so it was, it was, uh, uh, you know, I hadn't thought about it back then. It was just something that happened, but, uh, you know, it was just, uh, um, one of those odd things that, uh, I guess was just easy to hold on to for kids like us. And so, so I, you know, I, I always enjoyed comics. They were always with me. Uh, wherever I went and, um, uh, you know, I never read the comics surprisingly. I always just the covers. Just Gee, go the, figure. Yeah, well, Dave the Dorman liked the covers, the <laughs> you know, I, I love looking at the art. It was just really, really interesting. And so that's how I started drawing was copying, uh, you know, the panels out of the comics okay. and figuring out how, uh, you know, the, the artist did the structure of the human, you know, anatomy and, and action and, and just, you know, stuff like that. And that's, that's where I started. It wasn't until, you know, probably I was like 12 or 13, maybe that I actually started to read the comics <laughs> and, uh, you know, there's hey, stories in here. Yeah, these, are, these are pretty good stories. <laughs> yeah. But and, you know, comics, uh, co comics weren't the only thing that you were, uh, into at that time. I mean, we almost didn't get all this, I mean, incredible Dave Dorman artwork, uh, apparently sports was nearly the path you were going to take. Um, yeah. Want to tell um, us a little bit about that? Yeah. So, um, uh, I, I had always enjoyed sports when I was young. It's just something that, that I really liked playing baseball, uh, football. Um, I tried playing basketball. I, I wasn't tall enough. I was sort of a, a chubby little kid. So, you know, football was my game. Uh, and uh, I was a catcher, you know. So, uh, um, you know, my my uh, uh, size worked well for for what I was there. Yeah. Uh, and then I, I wrestled in, uh, in, in junior high and high school and I threw the shot put, uh, for track. So I did a lot of sports when I was younger and I really enjoyed it. Played, uh, um, boys club and played in school. So it was like a lot, a lot of sports. Yeah. You were um, pretty successful too. You were scouted for some scholarships, right? Yeah. Uh, so, so I got into high school and, um, you know, got onto the football team and, and, um, we ended up being ranked in the top uh, uh, 10 uh, football teams in the Washington, D.C. area. And, and we may even still be on the list, um, but we were good. We we were very good. So, you know, I had hopes of, of the possibility of going to uh, going to a college, uh, you know, getting uh, uh, scouted. Mm. Um, just because I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. Um, you know, I love to draw, I was painting, I was drawing and, and I really love that, but you know, it, it was a time that, uh, you know, parents, oh, you know, you can't make a living as an artist, <laughs> which has been the fallacy for years and years and for centuries. Uh, you, you can make a living as an artist. It's just that, uh, um, you know, you, you don't see it that often. Um, but it's there. So you got to be good. And so I, I, you know, worked at it. And then we went into the senior year and, um, uh, we lost a lot of good players, but you know, we had some great practices and we were doing very well. And then, uh, we were, uh, we were plagued by a number of injuries on the team. Um, one of which was me and, uh, I banged up my knee. I tore three cartilages in my knee. Oh man. And, uh, uh, you know, I went to the doctor. The doctor said, well, we can operate on you and, and, and you can play football again, but your knee's never going to be like it was. And you may end up with, uh, you know, some trouble when you get older or don't play football anymore. <laughs> so, you know, I was just, yeah, that was the decision. That was, yeah, yeah that was, well, sports that, loss was arts gain. That's, that's for sure. Um, we're glad not glad that the injury happened, but we're certainly glad that you had a career path, uh, a plan yeah, B. So, 
it, yeah, it was just a, yeah, change, changing my focus and and instead of uh, you know thinking towards um, you know having that that free ride in college uh, and then deciding it was you know I have to make my decision now and what makes me happy now is you know drawing and painting. So you what know, were those from, early years like? I mean, what Kubert School of Art and uh, a few other yeah. things too, just kind of leading up to. I think your big break was uh, November of '83 with heavy metal, right? Heavy metal, yeah. yeah. So what happened was, you know, I, I uh, um, uh, graduated uh, high school and then went to one year of college in, in St. Mary's of Maryland, which is in Southern Maryland. It's a small liberal arts college, and uh, they have a very good uh, um, art curriculum, but like most schools is is fine art you know it was uh, gallery painting and and modern art and abstract stuff and you know i knew no spandex right <laughs> that's right <laughs> sword and sword and sorcery <laughs> sword and sorcery that's right um, <laughs> wasn't on the curriculum you know yeah but so you know i that's that's right i knew exactly what i wanted to do was illustration um not fine art mm. and so the curriculum that, that they had didn't fit for what i wanted and so at that time, when I was at, at, at St. Mary's, I heard about the Joe Kubert School up in uh, Dover, uh, New Jersey. Uh, and so I contacted them. Obviously, I'm, I'm still reading comics. I'm still a voracious uh, comic reader. And, and, you know, that art is still influencing me. So uh, I knew Joe's work. And, and uh, um, you know, I looked at some of the um, people that were teaching there. And, and they were all professionals in the industry. So... Um, you know, I hadn't chosen, uh, to do painting at that time. I was still very interested in, in comic book art, um, you know, line drawing, you know, uh, anatomy, you know, storytelling, that type of thing. So, you know, I talked to my folks and, and, uh, um, you know, we decided to give the Kubert school a try. So this would have been 78, I believe. Um, and it would have been the second year of the Joe Kubert school. Uh, so it was uh, a very small, it was in what they call the mansion, which was a big, uh, house that Joe owned, uh, that, uh, had, uh, the, the first year student upstairs or the first year students downstairs and the second year students upstairs. Uh, so for me, the second year students were actually the very first class that Joe took in to the school. So I was there the second year of the school being open. And, uh, um, there were a lot of, of artists, uh, um, at the, at the time at the school, uh, Rick Veach and Tom Yates and, and Steve Bissett. And then my class was Tom Mandrake and, and, uh, Jan Dersma and Ron Randall and, and, um, uh, Kevin Altieri who went on to, to become a, a big animation director out in LA and, uh, you know, quite a few, uh, um, professionals came out of that. Uh, those two years. I mean, that's one of the reasons I, I stayed in the comic industry was because of those friendships and contacts that I made. Because um, mm. what, what happened was at the end of the first year, you know, I was still doing some painting and, and I was, I was you know, learning the drawing aspect of it. But, you know, Joe brought me into the office and we, we talked for about two hours at the end of the first year. And, and uh, it basically came down to Joe saying that, uh, uh, you know, Dave, I, I, I know you love painting and that's the direction you should go. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and then he said, the school doesn't offer you anything that, that we can teach you to help you with that. <laughs> Cause at the time it was black and white drawing. It was basically right. comic book drawing. They weren't teaching any type of, of uh, color curriculum. Now mm -hmm. it's very different. Uh, the school now has all sorts of color curriculum and, and painting and, and digital work and animation and stuff. But back then it was just strictly, you know, line, pen and ink and, and uh, uh, pencil. Well, how would you actually describe your style of art? Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, it's just an amalgamation of all the, the artists that uh, influenced me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just little bits and pieces that's that's how i taught myself how to paint i mean i didn't have any teachers in painting mm -hmm. i had teachers in drawing and you know for me a good a good painting starts with a good drawing yeah but as far as painting goes learning the techniques and the styles and the the bits and pieces that make you know one uh, uh artist's style different from another 
um, uh, is is uh, uh, something that that's learned, but you don't want to end up aping it. You want to mm. end up incorporating it yeah. into into what you do. So my, my style, it's an incorporation of of all the artists that I've loved over the years, and uh, I'd like to say that that I can see a particular style, but I can't. I just do what I'm comfortable with. And and I paint the way that that I see it in my head. Uh, so to describe my style, I can't. Uh, I mm. can I can point at it and say, look, you know, that's my painting. But uh, uh, you know, it's just it's just illustration to me. You know, it, it's, well, with it's, Frazetta, yeah. Frazetta is a major influence. It's obviously like that, it's obvious that right. that's the path you needed to go, and that that's a very specific path. Um, we're glad you did because we get all this amazing artwork out of it. Yeah. Um, look, let's talk Absolutely. about some of the. You're obviously known for your work in the Star Wars universe. We've got the the book, um, St- the art of uh, Star Wars, the art of Dave Dorman. So that's out right. there. But it, that I mean, that's what you're known for, for in the in the world of Lucasfilm. But it was really Indiana Jones that got the boulder rolling for you in that world, wasn't it? He yeah, was the, it was. he was the first one up. So let's let's get yeah. into Indiana Jones and talk about your relationship with Lucasfilm and Dark Horse sure. Comics and how Indiana Jones brought you into this, took you to the next level. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, it sort of ties back to the Kubert School. So you know, I, I went to one year at Kubert School and then I dropped out. Uh, and um, uh, you know, I, I talked with my folks and I said, you know, instead of paying for uh, college for me for the next two to three years, which is what it would have been. I, I just want to stay home and teach myself how to, how to paint. And so they let me stay home. I got a part-time job and, you know, contributed, uh, financially to the family, but I just, you know, spent all my time, uh, painting and drawing and, and getting better and getting better. And eventually, you know, we go back to that, uh, heavy metal sale, uh, for the first cover that I sold. Uh, and that sort of started the ball rolling and getting me a little bit more known in the industry. And then, uh, you know, I'd go to conventions and, and meet other artists and I'd see my friends from the Kubert school and, and, you know, we'd hang out and, you know, there is a, a camaraderie, uh, uh, there with, uh, artists in the industry and they help you out, you know, with, uh, uh, you know, letting you know what's available as far as work goes or, you know, pointing you in the right direction. And I ended up doing a whole lot of um, independent, uh, comic covers, stuff people don't know. Like I, I did Robotech, uh, covers for Kamiko for about two and a half years, <laughs> you know, doing line, line drawing anime covers, uh, for them. A lot of people don't know that, but, uh, you know, that got me into a number of things. Uh, uh, you know, it, it, uh, um, I, I just met a lot of people who eventually went on to Dark Horse, uh, Diana Schutz and, and Bob Shrek, who ended up editing uh, at Dark Horse, and, and Dave Stevens I met through Kamiko, and oh, just just a whole lot of a lot of people um, uh, that you you get to meet and you get to know, and and they stay you sort of in the background as as you progress through. And um, uh, Ron Randall was uh, uh, a schoolmate of mine at the Kubert School, and he was doing um, a Trekker with Dark Horse Comics. This would have been in 1987 or 88. And he asked me to do a cover for them, and, or for him, because it was his book. And I said, sure. So I did a cover for him, and, and that got me into Dark Horse. Mm. So I started doing you know various covers for Dark Horse, Dark Horse Presents, and, and I did uh, Mr. Monster uh, with, uh, with Michael Gilbert. I did some covers for him, and... And just a, a bunch of different covers. So I got to know the, the people there, Randy Stradley and Mike Richardson and then Diana and, and, you know, Bob came in. And so, you know, it got to be sort of a hangout for a lot of these people that I, well, not a hangout, but a job uh, for a lot of these <laughs> A paid these, hangout. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, they said if for, you do for, what you love, you're never going to work a day, that's the a, best, day of work. the best kind of you're job. You're never going to work a day of life in your life. Yeah. <laughs> You know, so so I knew a lot of but people when, there. But when? How did the indie? Like, when did you first ha- like hear about the indie? And just, I think it was around this time that they got the license, or like sniffing around the license, or something yeah. like that. And then, and then, were you an Indiana Jones fan when you heard about it? Too? <laughs> like, did you like Indiana yeah, Jones? I, okay, I was I was an Indiana Jones fan. As a matter of right. fact, when the, when the movie came out, they did a sneak preview in Washington D.C. They didn't say what it was. They oh. just said a new Steven Spielberg movie where sneak. Sneak previewing it this nice. uh, Saturday or Sunday at four o'clock, 
And, yeah. uh, you know, if, if you can, you know, get in line, you know, you can get a ticket. So I actually went down and, and just hung out. And, and so I got to see uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. What did like, you think when the first time you saw it? We're going back 40 years now, but like what? Yeah, I mean, it, it was fun. It was just really, really fun. It was unlike any any other uh, adventure movie. I mean, I, I love adventure movies. Uh, um, uh, I love war movies. And, and this was a, a real sort of throwback to the just constantly moving forward. Mm-hmm. Uh, something's always happening. There's no real lulls in the story. And uh, it was it was just just superbly directed and uh didn't you run uh, home and start mimicking Steranko? didn't you like <laughs> didn't you like i like, gotta get yeah, home and start uh, drawing stuff and i want Steranko. yeah and... well well yeah Steranko had done you know some pre-production artwork <laughs> right right uh, mm-hmm, he published mm-hmm. this magazine and, and i was just yeah you know i've been a fan of Steranko's for years and so <laughs> you know i sort of you know hopped on that uh, bandwagon you know for a, a couple drawings yeah, Joe and I but, thought maybe that was uh, Starenko was possibly the inspiration for your cover to the <laughs> third issue of a uh, of Fate of Atlantis. Are we wrong there? Yeah. Um, I <laughs> I won't say he wasn't an influence. <laughs> okay. uh, you can you check know, out the he, indie he, mag. Your interview in the indie mag. There's a picture of it. I, look, I I think yeah, it was because yeah. you drew <laughs> the Starenko <laughs> thing, but you put a girl there, and it's not Marion, right? Not, you see the no, sketch, it's not Marion. No, you know who no. I'm talking about, the pencil sketch, right? Yeah, the pencil sketch with the, the, the That's icon. three. That's a cover of three, yeah. right? <laughs> That's yeah, pretty much. <laughs> All right. Pretty much. Um, Good you know, the so, uh, uh, yeah, so I, I was familiar with uh, uh, with the movie. <laughs> uh, I had seen it. And actually, right. I had done uh, the, the cover of the indie mag. Um, I had done a previous version of it, and I think they reproduced it in yeah. the it's magazine. Yeah, they did. Uh, I did that for myself just because <laughs> – you know, being a film fan and, and an artist, you know, yeah, I'm going to paint the stuff I love. Yeah. So, you know, I did that uh, portrait of Indy and um, I sent a picture of it to Lucasfilm. And I said, I said, you know, I, I did this painting, you know, can I do some uh, uh, prints of it? And I got a, a letter back uh, from them saying, uh, you know, this is a nice, nice painting, but we don't do prints like that. You have to get involved with the company and, and they'll do the printing. And I was just, I was just, you know, I was just a snot nosed kid back then. I said, <laughs> okay, well, I, I'm not going to do anything with that. So, yeah. so, uh, you know, a couple of It was years just short by, of a cease and desist. Right? <laughs> like, yeah. Just much. shy of that. Well, yeah. It sounded like they were just being nice at that point. Like, uh, yeah, we kind of don't do that. You shouldn't either. <laughs> How, however, uh, you know, in looking back on it, it was a very small office back then. Yeah. Very small. And so I don't know if they had remembered that piece of artwork. All right. But when I was with Dark Horse, and, and you know, you share a lot of information when you're with fans and or with, uh, uh, you know, professionals at, at conventions, and you talk about projects, and, and uh, the name Indiana Jones came up, and, and I was just, oh, who's going to be editing that? <laughs> so I found out Randy Stradley is going to be editing. So I went to him, and I said, uh, uh, hey, if you don't have any, uh, um, you know, cover artists, uh, I'd be interested in, in doing it. And then I showed him the one that I did, and he said he really liked it. And um, uh, because I had done other work with them, and he knew that I was, you know, a professional, and uh, that I could do likenesses, you know, because I was I was starting to do likenesses back then. Um, he put my name in, into the hat, you know, uh, to Lucasfilm. And um, they came back and approved it. Wow! So yeah, I, mean, I mean, I mean, and we they, also we've heard so many artists that we've interviewed, so many artists uh, on the indie cast that we've interviewed that said that have said that it's so hard drawing Harrison Ford's face <laughs> and the fedora. <laughs> yeah, I had to buy a fedora. <laughs> ah, okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, all I right. mean, <laughs> even even with even with all the reference that uh, yeah. I was. Lied uh, during during that I had to buy a hat. To your credit, uh, you had just, you got them all in on every cover. To your credit, yeah, you didn't I, leave it off. I just couldn't do it. I had to have that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, some yeah, did. Exactly. Some did in the comics. Yeah. They got rid of that hat. The the first uh, chance, especially they... the Marvel comics. I mean, the Marvel yeah. uh, the Further yeah. Adventures series. A lot of a lot of times they left the they left the hat off. Did um, you did you no, buy an official so... indie hat? Like the, was it a 
Or no, no, I just right. uh, went went down to uh, some store and, <laughs> and looked them over and bought one that was uh, really close. So. What about Ford's <laughs> face? Well, like Keith said, what about Ford's face? Yeah, was that well, tough? Because it's you know, misshapen. But, it's not like chis- It's not like perfect. People always say it's not like classic lines or something. Or no, whatever. it's 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 not like classic lines. There's a lot of um, I, I won't say oddity to it years and mileage not, years and mi- <laughs> it's years of mileage exactly it, it's it's not uh it's not proportional yeah. uh, like, he got punched uh, in the face a lot in those yeah. movies so you know it's- yeah. but you know there's there's a rugged handsomeness to it yeah. yeah and um you know i would like to say i'm i'm a good enough artist that i can just draw it out of my head but i can't uh I, you know i'm not i'm not a caricaturist i i don't have that I that can pick out very specific elements and accentuate them to make the uh, uh, drawing look like the person, um, and and that's very hard to do, especially in a comic book where you're where you're doing it, you know, five or six panels per page, you know, for the course of a book. Um, some artists can. Uh, I can't, unfortunately. Well, walk so us through these. I, walk us through these adventures. There, do you got the covers? You probably got the covers around there somewhere, right? Or you, you oh, can remember. D- dude, I'm I'm sitting in my studio with <laughs> paints around me. I, I, oh, let me man. let me let me let me pull the uh, let me pull the Google up, and uh, <laughs> let, let me Google. Walk my, us through uh, some of these because it's obvious. Like Keith and I talk about this all the time when we reviewed the books. We kind of go through and go, let's talk about the cover, and we're like, Dave Norman, okay, he's awesome, and then we try to figure out like the reference points. So like. Some we know, like uh, what's cool in the indie mag is you get um, as you're looking this up, uh, people can check out the indie mag too. But there's like we see your your art table and we see your reference things, and not only like um, indie stuff, but there's like you know uh, different monuments and different things that you bring into it too. But then, well, like one cool thing is you'll have the deleted scene from Last Crusade with the tarantula crawling on Indy, right? So mm, that right. makes like a great reference point. And we see that that's brought out. I'm trying to remember which uh, I'll find. It's on uh, Iron Phoenix 2. So we yeah. see that. So Keith and I are always like trying to figure out like, okay, was that from Temple of Doom? Or was this or was this a like from Dave <laughs> well, Bowman's head? Was it, it, yeah. like, <laughs> it seems like the covers, the, the, the covers to Fate of Atlantis where each, like there, were, there was a pose taken from, I think almost each of the Indiana Jones movies. I mean, with with number one, you have Temple of Doom. Yeah. With you know number three, there's definitely a raid. That, that's definitely the Raiders shot in there. And uh, and number four, that's you know obviously him uh, on the tank from from Last Crusade. So yeah, right. we some we, of those we are love easy, picking yeah. that stuff out. You know, but Fate we of Atlantis, Fate of Atlantis two, there was a different one though, right? I think they you gave the Indie uh, Mag Fate like of, your your original yeah, one. Fate, yeah, Fate of Atlantis two. Yeah, so going back to. Um, uh, getting reference, yeah, um, and and being able to um, uh, produce these uh, uh, likenesses, uh, yeah. yeah, I would get as much information as as I could. Obviously, the movie was out, so I had a lot of books and and magazines and references. And um, uh, Lucasfilm was very uh, willing to uh, give me any references that I would ask for. Um, and, and, you know, unfortunately I would have to ask for something specific, uh, because I was dealing with, you know, image specific stuff. Um, so what I would end up doing is, um, taking the material, whatever was inside the book and just, you know, coming up with, um, some type of image that, uh, um, I could use good reference for, but still incorporate it into, the context of the story. So, um, like with issue three, uh, we have Indy, uh, up against the wall, uh, holding his gun. And then, um, I have, I can't remember the girl's name. Um, Sophia. The rest, Sophia. yeah, Sophia. Right. So, so the rest of it, I had Sophie. friends of mine pose for, um, I found a, a really interesting back alley shot, uh, from the middle East. And so I had a friend, a uh, friend of mine posed for for the girl and another Who friend. Who was Sophie? Give, let's give her some credit. Can you can you can we mention her? Um, I'd rather not. All right. No. <laughs> <laughs> She's lost the time. Um, AKA Sophie. But, That's fine. Yeah, That's fine. But the the the, the guys, the uh, um, Nazi guys running yeah. up through the uh, thing. Uh, that was a guy named Phil Burnett who. Oh, you uh, mentioned Phil as a Nazi. <laughs> sorry, Phil. Yeah. Hey, sorry, no, Phil. Phil. 
Phil, <laughs> Phil, Phil has has been posing for me for years. All right, thanks, Phil. And uh, he he was almost all of the GI Joes I I did for Hasbro. Oh, that's he right, posed, man. Yeah, almost all of those, and he was he was a good guy. He posed for the Rocketeer when I did the Rocketeer cover. Oh, and, uh, okay, so he redeemed himself. Okay, Phil. Yeah. Phil's the so, uh, <laughs> yeah. So anyway, uh, yeah. So that you know that I built around that one photograph of Indy against the wall. Did you have the story? Like, did you, like, did they send you, how much of the story did you have? Uh, A couple couple of, a couple of pages usually drawn and then just sort of an outline. It could be like one sentence or it could be like two or three paragraphs, basically just giving me an idea of where it's set and what characters they might like on it. So, um, uh, yeah, so that, uh, issue number two, the uh, ice, um, um, the, the uh, glacier, uh, the body piece. in the ice. Yeah, the body trap. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, um, uh, I had I had done that um, first, and and they, the way that that uh, um, publishing works is is you have a certain time frame to do things. Uh, the solicitation actually needs to be done first because. That's what people, uh, the shops order from. So usually you see uh, the cover for that. Mm. So that doesn't, the insides don't need to be done necessarily at the same time the cover does because by the time that the cover is shown in the solicitation books, that's usually about four or five months before the book is, is to be printed and then, you know, sent to the publisher so or sent to the printer. So the artwork for the cover has to be done first very early. Um, so, you know, I was working on this and I did that first version of, of Indy hang, hanging uh, from the rope with the, um, with the guy in the glacier uh, behind him. And uh, I was working with um, just a head photograph. I couldn't find a, a good shot of Indy hanging from a rope. <laughs> so, so I went through, you know, looking for the proper look on his face, uh, in a photograph of sort of turning and, and looking with, uh, you know, maybe some fright or some, some astonishment. And, uh, I wasn't able to, to really get that. So I did this sort of very, um, un, unadventurous, uh, looking indie it's good uh, for that. Well, you, it's you, good, you but there's, it's, <laughs> it's good. Well, it's good, but I, but when you compare it, I go, Oh, that's there's, what there's Dorman no tension saw. to yeah, it. Yeah. 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 Like, oh, that's yeah, why he did. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I did it and uh, they used that for the sol- solicitation only. <laughs> and ab- about two or three weeks after I finished the painting, I said, you know, I'm really not happy with this <laughs> and it needs more drama. And so, um, yeah, it does. And so, basically, I repainted it. I had Phil come over and pose for me. <laughs> and, oh, in a oh, Phil's Indy in this one. Yeah, <laughs> nice. So you know, I, oh, I had I you know tied a rope on top of the fence and had him sort of hang off it, <laughs> and uh, uh, you know, and then I, and then I eventually found a good headshot of Indy to you know just sort of use for it. So. Um, so yeah, I, it turned out to be a much better cover. How long um, did Phil hang like that off your, off your fence? <laughs> oh, probably about 20 minutes. That's pretty you know, good. I, That's pretty good. Yeah, probably I longer should, than Harrison should, Ford ever should, hung around. Yeah. I shoot about 20, 30, 40, you know, photographs, All right. uh, you know, having to move around and, and this Thanks, is what Phil. I do for, for everybody. Yeah. And so. I, uh, honestly, uh, yeah, though, you so, know, I gotta, I gotta say, uh, Joe, I don't know about you, but I still remember that, uh. Walking into my local comic book shop took me about 25 minutes to walk there when I was I was about 14 years old, you know, walking into that comic book store and seeing issue number one of Fate of Atlantis that 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 right now for me iconic cover of Indy with the whip. Yeah. And the sword uh, standing in front of that wall with the waves on it, and I immediately was like, "Yes." Well, you we, were a Temple we'll... of Doom fan, and you were a uh, Fate of Atlantis fan, so this had Absolutely. to be like, like Keith's, Keith's young brain like exploded <laughs> with Dave Dorman <laughs> really goodness, uh, like in the comic book. Well, but wasn't that the thing with Dark Horse? It was like, make the covers pop off the newsstand. Be good. Doesn't well, matter what's inside of them; just grab well, it. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> 
uh, Some but, of the stories. but yeah, I mean, that, that certainly was a, a promotional thing was, yeah. was have a cover because that's what the people are going to see. Yeah. Very like first thing. If, yeah. If they don't walk over to that book and pick it up because the cover's intriguing, yeah. you lose a sale. Yeah. And so Dark Horse knew that. And I knew that just from, you know, I'm a commercial artist. That's what people hire me for. So you got Keith, uh, you got Keith, you got young <laughs> Keith Voss. They got me. Yeah. He's like, I gotta but, have this. But you, you know, <laughs> you know, my my style changed a little bit during this time period too, because uh, at this po- time, you know, there were still really good illustrated movie posters out there, mm, that's right, yeah, yeah. and I wanted to do movie poster like images for both these and, and Star Wars, and so I was I was adapting, uh, you know, a little bit of of a of a, a style. Uh, technique from some of the uh, uh, illustrators that I like, uh, you know, primarily Drew Struson, but mm. uh, uh, Bob Peak um, uh, was one of them. He did some really wonderful poster work. Uh, Tommy Chung, who did the first uh, couple of Star Wars posters, um, you know, just little elements uh, picking up to make it more um, movie posterish. Did you ever get any uh, feedback from Lucasfilm? Like any do's and don'ts? Like you know, you can you can definitely uh, have Indy in this pose, but you can't have Indy in this pose. Anything like that? No, uh, I didn't have any any feedback as far as as you know problematic with the poses. Um, uh, the uh, Indy number three, I had to take the uh, um, uh, the Nazi swastika off of the mm. uh, armbands, and then on Iron Phoenix number one. Uh, originally, it, there was a, a swastika in the uh, circle underneath the uh, iron uh, so eagle. So this is Fate of Atlantis. You're talking issue three with the swastika on the armband, right? Mine has mm. a swastika on the armband. Does it? Yeah. Oh, well, I there are it. different different parts of the world that, like, especially Germany, Austria, stuff like that. They don't they don't allow. Uh, oh, any... so maybe they had different. Oh, okay, that's possible. so. There's probably yeah, they, some some different they, covers okay. uh, that that are yeah. out there. Yeah, it's definitely for, issue uh, four. I ha- it's on there. That's interesting. Okay. Is it? Yeah, it is. Okay. Uh, maybe maybe I'm mistaken. I know that they had me take it off very specifically. Like Keith said, they may, they may have wanted a, a version of that. Well, you, maybe they got feedback or something off Fate of Atlantis. Because I know with the toy line, they couldn't do that. They had to be careful. They had to call them, what, German soldier, I think, in the toy line and things like that. So they had to be really careful about stuff like that. So maybe yeah. by the time from Fate of Atlantis got to here, they were like, hey, these are kids' comic books. We should probably not do it. So that's probably the feedback you got. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm trying Fe- to find the one with the zombies on it. Cause well, that's were- Iron Phoenix 4, and that's what yeah. Keith and I wanted to ask you about because I think Iron Phoenix, uh, Thunder in the Orient came out before – Iron Phoenix, but I think you've mentioned previously that Thunder in the Orient was the last indie work you did because you only did the one cover. I don't believe it. It did. I think Thunder in the Orient came after Iron Phoenix. Um, I, I did check the inside right before we got here, so it's at least Thunder in the Orient is listed as ninety three, and Iron Phoenix is listed as ninety four. But I think they may have produced them to, in different orders. Mm. So they may, so that, they may that, have had you working be, on something. Yeah, yeah, I could tell you what happened with that. I, I did all of Iron Phoenix, yeah, and uh, uh, those turned out real good. I, I think the the <laughs> Nazi zombie one was just really fun. That was really pulpy. Uh, yeah, Keith Voss. Yeah, yeah, young Keith Voss. Keith Voss likes <laughs> Nazi zombies. <laughs> <laughs> he likes I mean, um, you can't get pulpier than that. Nazi that's, zombies. I mean, come on. Right. Because even in these look you have on his face, he's like, "Come on, really? Nazi <laughs> zombies? I got it. Really? Oh, whatever." <laughs> yeah. So. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I had done that, and then the next, for, for me, the next uh, series would have been uh, Thunder in the Orient. Right. And um, uh, I said I'd do it, and I I got to the first one, but I believe that I was working on Tribes at that point. Mm. And to me, Tribes was a bigger project than yeah. – Indiana Jones, at that point in my career, I, Tribes was a book that I, I was trying to get off the ground for years and years and years. Mm. And so um, personal, uh, yeah. I did the first cover, and uh, I think I did some sketches for the second and third cover. But okay. it turned out that uh, I was unable to uh, uh, finish uh, that series. So they pulled in uh, Hugh Fleming. Yeah. Uh, for well, and, those covers still i mean you you guys both knocked it out of the park with that series so we're glad we we got that to cover uh let's talk a little bit about iron phoenix man indy on a motorcycle you you want to hear a funny story about uh, hugh 
Yes, please. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, I, I first met Hugh in San Diego, uh, probably in 89 or 90. Um, and uh, he brought a whole bunch of uh, Indiana Jones samples you know, to me. Uh, at, 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 at nobody knew who he was. And uh, uh, I was, uh, wow, these are really, really good. <laughs> and uh, he, he said, yeah, I was supposed to talk to Dark Horse. Uh, I'll take you over. So I took him over to Dark Horse and introduced him to uh, Randy Stradley, who was the editor. And I said, you got to look at this stuff. And uh, so I left him there. And uh, little did I know that uh, he was going to step in and, and uh, you know, pick up my, uh, my dropped ball and, and, you know, keep it moving. Uh, so it was very cool to. Uh, I love that. Uh, well, sort of it says a lot. Of, that's the thing. It says a lot about you, though, as an artist too. Because and I, and I don't think Keith and I would consider that a drop ball. It's like you had already done a bunch of Indiana Jones stuff. You had a right. personal project that you wanted to go on. That was a deal you made. You 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 uh, no, you picked up the ball and ran it to the ten yard line, and then you took it across. So that was pretty cool. But I love the fact that you didn't see this as him was like, uh oh. Here's uh, I'm gonna be out of a job, Indiana Jones. Yeah, you're like, hey, toes, right, yeah, right. like you introduced him. To, so that's that's amazing. That's that's a total class Indiana Jones movie right there that you did. Too. Yeah, so, yeah. So you know, I I've never worried about the um, yeah. that type of thing because I figure if someone's gonna be, uh, you know, good and want to take my work, I just have to get better and be better than them. Uh, so in. You know, Issue so, four of Iron Phoenix is your favorite one of that series, not the uh, the motorcycle. You like you prefer zombies to motorcycles. Oh, the motorcycle, the motorcycle one. That was sort of that was sort of goofy because I took Indy off of a horse, <laughs> yes. and I I mounted him on a motorcycle. <laughs> you know, I I still look at that and just think it's weird. Uh, All I, right. I don't, think, <laughs> I don't know what you guys think. You know, I I mean it's it's a nice dynamic cover, but. Yeah. It just looks kind of weird. To me. I'll just say I prefer four. I'll All right. <laughs> it's not shocking. You're a zombie guy. You like your zombies. I, I just love two because it's that deleted scene from Last Crusade. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's the tarantula, exactly. and it got reworked into an actual adventure, too. Yeah, that was really fun to, to work with because they, they sent me um, a photo, uh, and this was way before this this photo actually got out, um, of, of him. Um in in that scene and it was just like a waist up shot it was like a waist in the shoulder uh and um and his face with that look on it was just a great look yeah, there's a and, tarantula going up his chest isn't there yeah yeah yeah, yeah. but but they they and here they he's got poison ivy photograph. crawling up him <laughs> yeah they sent me a big photograph with it with an um a uh, uh, black streak right across it and, and they said they said do not print because <laughs> it, it was it was it was just one of those that uh, uh, yeah. you know because the the set photographers take just thousands of shots yeah uh, yeah and this was this was one that uh, uh, they didn't want to use uh, in the promotion. Scene. You and, still yeah. have all those uh, reference materials at, uh, at yeah, home somewhere? Yeah. Oh yeah. man! Wow! How cool! Uh, <laughs> so so I, I I just had this one sort of square um, of the the face and then and then the tarantula on his chest. And so I had my friend Phil, you know, pose for the rest of it. With a real story. tarantula on his chest or what? No. <laughs> no but Did I, you wrap I, him up in poison I ivy? Some, <laughs> I wrapped some, some uh, extension cords around, uh, <laughs> around his <laughs> arm. So, you know, so I, I could have, you know, some real tension. Because <laughs> if you just sort of fake it, it can look fake. Yeah. But yeah. if you have, you know, some, something pulling... Uh, you have the tension, and it'll make it a little bit more realistic. Well, I think you even said this in one of your recent Dave dugouts too. Uh, Dave's dugout is that like the clothing, the folds in the clothing. I think you you were saying like yeah. just you. I saw that in one of the recent ones. That's pretty cool. Um, these are amazing. Uh, we're, we're glad we got them. Look, in the time we have left, Keith and I wanted to ask you about something too. Um, I know you've yeah. mentioned this in your book. You're very honest about it in your book. And considering the past year. I think that everybody's been through uh, with with just so so much bad news and people are you know kind of down everything. Um, I thought this was kind of inspirational. You mentioned in your book in two thousand eight. We were all like grooving because Indiana Jones was back. You had a different. Your two thousand eight was very different, right? Like, can you sort of just tell it? You don't have to get into all the details, but if you can just kind of give us an overall of like what you went through when you turned fifty um, and what you learned from that and how you came out of the other side of something that you were experiencing. 
God, I've got to go back in my head. Let me let me think. Give, <laughs> give I, don't, me a I don't want to what dredge I, up too much. Well, no, you were talking about the, the midlife crisis. You mentioned about the midlife crisis that oh, you went through and you turned well, 50. It, it and... was, yeah, it wasn't necessarily a midlife crisis. It was just a, a life crisis, really. Um, you know, both uh, at the time, you know, both my wife and I were freelancers. And, and you know, 2008, 2009, it was a really bad uh, time, you know, People, you know, the, the depression was was in, um, and uh, it was hard to make a living. And um, we had just moved moved from Florida to Chicago, um, and the realtor in our um, our Florida for our Florida house said that she'd be able to sell the house in like two months, and uh, so that's how we sort of planned things out. And so we moved to Chicago and, you know, we bought the house and had a mortgage on that. Um, well, the house took 18 months to sell. Mm. So we were basically paying two mortgages, um, f- you know, to live in one house, um, which was just awful. And then the, the depression happened and it was hard to find work. And, um, you know, we had our, our son you know, our son was, was four years old and, um, it was just, it was just a really bad time mentally. And, you know, I always thought that, that my, my art would carry me through the bad times, um, that, that someone would always be interested in the art. And, you know, that was the time when things just sort of dried up everywhere. Um, I, I uh, wasn't getting any more work from Magic the Gathering, which was re- a regular thing, you know, up until that point. Um, Dark Horse wasn't publishing a whole lot. Um, Marvel, you know, had no interest in, in working. It just, just you know, the, the toy field I was doing a little bit. And uh, it's just, just really hard to find work. And so I, I got into a depression, you know, like I say, I was, like you said, I was turning 50, uh, you know, and I was just had really, I was really depressed too. And that ended up not to be a good thing for anybody. Um, so, you know, um, I lost a year of my life. I literally, I can't remember doing work during that period. Um, the only thing I remember really is the uh the star wars um uh celebration print where i did uh, vader and all the troops the first widescreen print oh, i, yeah, I yeah. did uh and the reason i remember that is because uh i had about 20 um 501st guys the the stormtrooper uh uh legion guys come over and pose for me wow, and fantastic. my son was my son was just in 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 heaven uh, seeing all these stormtroopers <laughs> in the house and and Darth Vader in the house and and we had a cookout and you know that was a real high point during that period but I don't remember painting that painting at all I remember wow photographing it but I don't and, and there's there's work that I did during that period that I just don't remember it was just you know th- that's how deep my depression was and uh, uh, you know we eventually lost the house and. Um, uh, you know, almost filed for bankruptcy, and and uh, it took a few years to get us back on our feet. But then, you know, things turned around a little bit, and and uh, I started getting more work, and and um, you know, things things worked out well uh, eventually. And then, you know, COVID hit. <laughs> yeah, here we are, ten years after that. Yeah, uh, COVID hit, and you know, I'm. During this year, uh, I found that I'm doing the best work in my career. Um, I've decided just to do the work that I want to do. And that's that's part of what Dave's Dugout is all about, is allowing me to do paintings that, that I just want to do. Well, that goes back to that lesson that you talk about in 2008 and 2009. You mentioned this in your book, too, that you hit that point and you almost kind of reinvented yourself. You had talked about, like you know, you know, thinking like the best years of your art were behind you. How did you reach that point where you realized, no, I can be doing better. I think you compared it to like, 
um, the, the, the blocks or the bricks of gold <laughs> and things like that. And then kind of, you almost kind of reinvented yourself at that point. And I'm guessing yeah. those are the lessons you brought into to 2020 with you. Yeah, th- that's, that's very true. You know, I, I, in, in thinking about it, um, as, as I was getting better, it was, it was like being an actor who is, is, uh, you know, stuck in a role. Um, uh, they're typecast. They can only do really one thing because that's what they were known for. And, uh, I was known for two things, Star Wars and Indiana Jones. And, um, uh, that, you know, and, and building a career on that, um, part of it was that I had gotten to, uh, an, a height in my career that people were afraid to ask me to do work for them because they thought I would charge too much. Mm. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a commercial illustrator. I have been all my life, so I know what the market is. And, uh, if, if I, I would tell them later, you know, uh, years after, um, you know, I, I'd have editors say, you know, we didn't call you because we thought you'd be too much. And, and I just said, you know, I live my life as a commercial illustrator. I, I need to work. And, uh, you know, this, this isn't fine art, of, uh, you know, gallery painting in, in New York city where, you know, too bad, you know, you're not paying the $20,000. Just call me. I'll yeah. tell you if it's too just much or not. <laughs> Yeah, and, that's right. And so, you know, make that the was, call. That was, that's such good advice. Yeah, for people out there listening, just make the call for people when to hire. Yeah, 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 exactly. And and I, I tell I tell editors now. I said, don't think that that you, yep. uh, the artist that you're calling, is priced out of your market. Yep. Just call them and and find out. He might um, have some time it, on his hands. <laughs> yes. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Especially with, with guys in, in my generation. Yeah. There's a lot of guys in my generation who are really good artists that aren't being called because the editors think that they're, they're too expensive. Mm. You know, we, we're, all, we're all journeymen. We're all working guys. Um, yeah. if, if you think you're priced out of the market or if you price yourself out of the market, that's your fault. Um, so anyway, yeah. So so I got to thinking that that I need to to step out of out of what I do, what I've been known to do. Not not step away from it completely, but step out of it in in certain respects uh, to try to broaden my horizons and and uh, you know do paintings that I want to do instead of maybe one a year. Um, do a little bit more, satisfy myself uh, artistically. Uh, with my creations rather than having to, um, you know, work under the constraints of, of license and, and, uh, editors and, and, and doing a project specifically for, um, you know, something. So yeah, that, that really did change the way that, that I started thinking about the art and, and now 10 years later, it's come to fruition. Um, I'm doing far more artwork of mine that's actually selling. Um, then, then I am doing published work. Um, but that's not to say that, that if dark horse, you know, wants to do another series or probably, well, Marvel won't hire me. So, <laughs> you know, uh, I think they, they'll have it now, uh, now that it's yeah. D- Disney Marvel, they won't hire me, but, um, uh, and that's a whole long story in itself. Well, well, you know, George Lucas even himself once said that, you know, films are never finished, they're only abandoned. Do you agree with him? I mean, since since you said that you're spending a lot more time for yourself and maybe even revisiting some things, is there any of your pieces that you wish you could go back to or something that you could that you would want to revisit? Oh, absolutely. As a matter of fact, uh, just last week on Dave's Dugout, I took a painting that uh, – that I, I had finished and and uh, it it eventually wasn't used, but it's been sitting here for like five years, and I just basically repainted the whole thing. I was gonna I was gonna uh, just change some of it, but uh, I eventually ended up repainting the whole painting. Oh wow! <laughs> and, wow! Uh, uh, yeah. So so yeah, I I can understand from a creative point of view what Lucas is talking about there, and mm. uh, I mean even Frazetta, I didn't know this at the time. Even Frazetta was changing his his paintings after he got them back from the publisher saying i don't like this or i don't like that so you know i don't feel as bad uh, when i when i look at something and say gee you know i i'd like to change it if i could mm-hmm. and you know if i still own the painting yeah I, I might just grab it from my flat file and and pull it out and, and you know, <laughs> fix it bring bring it up to date 
Uh, but yeah, I can understand him. I, I don't ha- have any faults against, you know, what he did with the, uh, um, with the new versions of, of the star Wars films. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's a creative, uh, the creator's, uh, prerogative mm. uh, to do what they want. It, it's not, it's not in, in, uh, in favor of the fan. It's in favor of the creator. Um, the, you know, the person who watches it, you know, they're either going to like it or they don't. The creator, the, the, the person who's, who's doing the, the actual work, uh, they have to be satisfied. So, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll look at things in some of these Indiana Jones paintings and I'll say, wow, I'd change that if I could. Okay, well, that's the brilliance <laughs> of Dave's dugout because we'd love to see Indiana Jones work his way back into this, too. Um, look, we, we mentioned that we want to talk about how to, how to find you on social media. But first, you, you kind of alluded to it. Marvel and Disney have the license, obviously, Indy 5 right around the corner. We're going to get more comic books. We've got to kind of figure that. Is is that a possibility that you that you would want to take that on? And you kind of alluded to the fact that maybe that wouldn't be a possibility since uh, it's, it's up to them. Okay. It's up to them. I mean, I mean, uh, when when Lucasfilm did you yell at somebody uh, or something? <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's there's a there's all right a whole thing going all on. Right, all um, right. When when Lucasfilm, real quick, uh, two things changed when Lucasfilm got geared up for the prequels. Um, they hired a lot of new people at Lucasfilm. Uh, it, it was like a, a five man organization, uh, up through Indiana Jones and, and, uh, uh, Star Wars, you know, Dark Empire, Crimson Empire and, and, uh, Fate of Atlantis. I could call them and I was on first name basis with everyone in the office. Um, they geared up for, uh, um, Phantom Menace and, and the, the prequels. They hired a whole lot of new people, which, Sort of moved people away from from who I knew, and had a relationship with, which obviously made it harder to to make connections and, and work. And then when Disney uh, bought Lucasfilm, everyone that I had been in contact with was gone completely. Mm-hmm. So I have no contacts with anyone. Right. Any so, uh, yeah, but you're the number one Star Wars artist of all time, right? That's voted. Well, on you know, I, I would like I would like to think so. But uh, was, I think it's a fish. I think it's a magazine. That was Twenty years ago, you know. Uh, <laughs> still, still, it's like an Oscar. I still won the Oscar, so you know. No, no, there you go. That's that's true. You know, you're always an Oscar winner but, when you get one. So but, you're always you know, the number one. Yeah, but or you are know, you the I'll, sexiest man alive? Is that does that, does that, oh, does that hold yeah, true for that as well? Um, um, okay. But but I I would work with them if they called. I'm right. uh, um, to a point where where I I'm I'm happy to do it because I love to do it. But I'm not going to beg to do it. I'm not going to go to them and say give me work. Fair enough. Uh, no, they, you're getting they, look. You're getting twelve hundred bucks for your last Harrison Ford print. So I think the, I think the audience is there. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the ca- cash speaks, and yeah. Dave Dorman is selling yeah. Indiana so, Jones. So I'm not so. saying that that it's not going to yeah, happen. Right. I'm saying that that uh, you know Disney, they don't know me there, so maybe someone will, will throw my name into the ring. Marvel, there's some, some bad blood due to some stuff that wasn't m- of my fault, um, but that's the way it is nowadays. And uh, I doubt if they'll be giving me a call. But uh, yeah, I think you Disney's know, probably making all the calls these days anyway. Yeah. So well, hopefully we'll, we'll see that. The one one hope would be. Um, they're still doing uh, variant covers for um, comic shops and such. So, um, you know, in, in the course of uh, the Marvel Star Wars, I did three variant covers for the Marvel books, even though they went through various comic shops. So if there's comic shop versions of, of uh, Indiana Jones, that'll be a much easier way to get through to, uh, uh, to do a cover. That'd be uh, that'd be a step, but uh, yeah, we're gonna hold out hope for Indiana Jones five and and maybe yeah. maybe even a monthly. That'd be kind of cool. Um, I want to make sure we get all these Facebook and yeah. Instagram. Dave Dorman artist, also Dave Dorman's studio on Facebook. So check that out. Twitter is at Dave Dorman, and then of course the website DaveDorman.com. Do we get them all? Do we get? Do we get right. he's, so go sell uh, some stuff. Go give him your money. Get, yeah, <laughs> shut up and yeah. take our money. But- so there, there you go. Send, us a, <laughs> send me some uh, Bitcoin. 
That's uh, there you go. Uh, my goodness, Dave. I'm telling you what, we yeah. have marveled at your work for years, both Keith, myself, all the listeners out there. We truly appreciate your stunning images for two of our favorite franchises, Indiana Jones and Star Wars, of course, uh, and all the other stuff you got going on. Thank you so much for bringing these characters to life. Thanks for Dave's dugout. Thanks for keeping us entertained in quarantine. And thank you for joining us on the IndieCast. It's been my pleasure. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks, guys. Well, there you have it, indie fans. Another fantastic sit down in the Raven's Nest. Keith, what stood out to you in that conversation? There's so much. We covered a lot of material. Oh, we covered a lot of stuff there. No, I mean uh, Nazi zombies. His, Nazi zombies, <laughs> of course. Uh, no, I mean it just just everything from his start, from his sports career, from uh, even even um, even during his dark times. I mean, that was a very inspirational yeah. uh, moment in the conversation for me, especially. And I mean, it, it was especially just for it what was we're going absolute... through now, Keith, how bad yeah, is like yeah, this past year yeah. been? And we're all kind of like in that zone right now where we're just like, ah, you know, and, and people are still yeah. keeping at it. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. and it, I, I just think it was very inspirational to hear that he's still, you know, working. He's still um, going into his studio. He's still, he's doing something live for people. He's bringing joy to people. So, so that it, it's just very inspirational. So, uh, it is. It is. And what what you're doing now, what you're doing now and what you've prided yourself on before and maybe think you're away from that. You're not. It's sometimes we it's our perceptions of that. And I think and you you, yeah. you see that in his book, Rolling Thunder, too. Uh, I think it's out of print, uh, but yeah, it's real price on the internet. But um, it's he, he kind of details that time in his life, too. And I th- and that was, you know, back in 2008, 2009. Boy, does it resonate these days, too. So I, it I certainly love that does. fact. And I think when you look at his artwork now, when we look at this Indiana Jones artwork, because he's, he's referencing that in the Star Wars years and then kind of talking about now, boy, you can just see how he's just continuing to go and continuing to, to get better and taking pride in what he's accomplishing and what his family's accomplishing. So, boy, that, that was that's one of my favorite interviews of all time, I think. That, Same that's here. Stood, yeah. Same here. That's it. Well, what, what about you, listeners? What what stood out for you? Do you have some specific artwork of Dave's that you love? Do you have you met him at a convention and he signed it? Have you had commissions? Um, what tell us what's on your mind? You know, even the 4K release, are you getting it? Are you are you spending money? On this? What, what what stories would you like to see in new Indiana Jones comics? Uh, more Nazi zombies, Keith? You want more Nazi zombies, right? <laughs> I always want Nazi (laughs) zombies. zombies. (laughs) Tell us, Keith, how can they drop us a line and tell us what's on their mind? Well, like always, guys, you can get in touch with us. You can email us at thefurtheradventures at gmail.com. Also, reach out to us on our Facebook page. Give us a like over there if you haven't already. We want to hear from all of you guys. Okay, that's it for the day, then. Okay, kids, as Indiana Jones says, that is it for today. Huge thanks to Dave Dorman for dropping by today. Keith and I are hard at work getting ready for the next further adventures segment hoping to line up another conversation with a talent from the dark horse years more on that in the weeks ahead stand by follow us on our further adventures page we're going to let you know if that works out official 40th anniversary of raiders of the lost ark and the 4k release right around the corner indiana jones 5 hopefully gearing up for filming soon it is a great time to be an indiana jones fan right now indeed it is and a fantastic time to be a further fan right i mean really appreciate all of you IndieCast listeners out there, looking forward to the next time we can all get together right here on the further adventures of Indiana Jones. 